Help. This is a major press release from the Tate Museum in London. A major work has been stolen and they request our urgent help before the work disappears from view forever. Often a work that's stolen from a, a museum goes into a private collection and we may not see its face for a generation or two. And so they've given us a number of clues. The work is two-dimensional, it's naturalistic, it's narrative, it's abstract, and there's some very important elements that are used, line, shape, color, and value. It uses several types of line, in fact, implied line, outline, contour line, and hatched line, and I'm sure you can recognize the difference. The shapes are hard-edged, and there's spatial depth implied in the work. There's a lot of pattern, and there's actually more than one focal point. So let's look at some works. A total of seven coming up, but this is a pair, one by Max Ernst and another by Frederick Church. And to be the stolen piece, the works have to be either uh, have to be two-dimensional. So let's look at these. Are these paintings both two-dimensional or are they three-dimensional? We'll look at them closely. Here is Max Ernst. So what do you see? If you look carefully, what is on the surface of this painting? Is it a cabinet knob? a little tiny house, a gate. All of these items are collaged onto the surface of this painting and they make this painting have a little bit of mass, a little bit of volume. It may not be as three-dimensional as a sculpture, but it does have a relief sculpture element. So now let's look at Frederick Church, Twilight in the Wilderness. This painting looks three-dimensional, but is it really? Let's take a look. Here the artist has used a lot of painting tricks to create the illusion of depth and dimensionality. So here we have a horizon line, and we have linear perspective with the vanishing point. Uh, notice how the scale of the mountains fits very neatly within the progressively smaller scale of the linear perspective. And then finally, look at the size of the rock here in the foreground and compare it to the background. Something as simple as size change can make, make this work look very dimensional. Take a look at the bright colors and dark colors that are in the foreground, the very light colors that are in the background. All of this supports this illusion. So out of the two pieces, which do you think is the uh, the would be a choice. Is it the Ernst or is it the church? So we'll vote. I think we can choose the church in this case. So now let's look at a couple of other pieces. Here we have Francisco Zubaran, the martyrdom of Saint Serapion, and we can compare it to the Frederick Church landscape. So to be the stolen work of art, it has to be both naturalistic and narrative. So are both of these works naturalistic? So naturalistic means that the subject matter and the way the painting is created makes it resemble people, places, and animals seen in the world around us. So I think we can say that both of these paintings are naturalistic. But is it narr are they both narrative? Take a look at this piece. If you were standing in the museum in front of this work, you would be able to see this, this small piece of paper that's been painted onto the surface of the painting that tells a story about this particular martyred saint. 
So is this one narrative? I think so. This painting is narrative and naturalistic. The Frederick Church painting might bring out feelings of uh, connection to the landscape, beauty to the landscape. It could even inspire ideas or philosophies. But is it truly narrative? So here we're looking at Francisco de Zubaran again, and a 20th century artist, Richard Diebenkorn, girl looking at a landscape. So at first glance, both of these paintings seem to have some similarities, enough so that they could easily be the stolen painting or the stolen artwork. Uh, so what do you think? Are they both naturalistic? Are they both narrative? Um... Yes, I would say so. But what is the difference between these two? There's definitely a difference. What is the mode of representation that we see in each of these two works? Uh, take a look at St. Serapion. He is highly realistic, and Richard Evencorn's work is less so. In fact, the question is, is it naturalistic and is it abstract? Can a work be both abstract and naturalistic at the same time? Mm -hmm. So the answer there is yes. Uh, Richard Evencorn's work is definitely abstract. Abstract uh, means that a work is reductive, meaning that the lines, shapes, and volumes that the artist saw and painted are simplified and they're reduced to their essence. In abstract painting, imagery is rendered by the artist in a reductive, stylized, or streamlined manner. So I think we can get rid of, the, of Zubaran because we know that the artwork is abstract. The one that is stolen is abstract. So here we see Richard Diebenkorn. And uh, shapes are considered uh, an important clue in whether this work is the stolen piece. So let's take a look at some of the shapes in that work, and let's compare it as well to another work that will be shortly appearing. What is happening inside this white, uh, white, white area, the area that's defined by the white lines? Take a look at that skirt. What you are seeing there is a lot of loose, soft brush strokes that change color as the, the form of the skirt moves up and across the form of the, of the human body. And notice how you have cooler tones on the front side, warmer tones across the top. And while they are not very distinct, these soft edged brush strokes are creating uh, shapes. So there is such a thing as a soft edge shapes, and these, this is a very great example of one. But let's go back to our clues. So what kind of shapes are in the stolen work of art? Are they soft edged or are they hard edged? Yes, we see some geometric hard edge shapes in this work, particularly in the floor, perhaps in the windows, but the soft edge shapes are not in the running, so let's compare it to this piece, Wham, which is by Roy Lichtenstein. Roy Lichtenstein's work is quite different. There are uh, hard edge shapes. Predominantly, I don't see. Do you see any soft edge shapes in that piece? I don't. Uh, take a look at the variations of the shapes that you have. You have rectangles, uh, black and white alternating on the tail of the plane. You have black and white shapes centered around the geometric star. Uh, you have kind of streamlined, flowing shapes, but they're not particularly organic are they particularly soft edged they may be organic but they're not particularly soft edged take a look at the flames of the exploding plane they're uh, almost alive they have a very 
uh, organic look, but they're, notice how hard edged they are. We could call those squiggly, perhaps. So I think we should keep this one. Let's compare it to Kazimir Malevich. He is calling this the suprematist composition. And what kind of differences do you see between Roy Lichtenstein's work and Kazimir Malevich's work? It's Does Cal Kazimir Malevich use any organic shapes? Or is he only using geometry? So one of the clues was that this work is uh, has both organic and geometric shapes. So I think we'll have to eliminate Kazimir Malevich, as interesting as his work may be. Line and shape are mentioned as important elements in the missing work. What kind of lines do you see? Let's look at Lichtenstein's wham. Outline is defined as an even width line that delineates the edges of shapes. Outline flattens forms. Contour lines have varying degrees of thickness and thinness along the linear path. This variation helps to activate our perception of volume. It can be as simple as a thinning at the edge of the line as it moves across a form. Implied lines are not actually drawn. They're often created by juxtaposing shapes against each other or by lining up elements in a composition. So here we're looking at Lichtenstein again. Notice how the jet plane is uh, painted using clear, hard outlines and how the contour lines swell and thin as they move across the nose of the plane. This creates the illusion of volume and space. The outline shape of the, plane, of the airplane itself is actually uh, broken into smaller shapes created by outlines, and it creates a very nice rhythmic alternating pattern. Notice the gray shape of the shadowed half of the plane creates an implied line that parallels the axis of the plane. Here, let's look at Hokusai. In his print, what do you actually see? Let's look carefully. Do you see any shapes uh, that are linear, which lead our eye around the composition? That's a very strong element in this work. But what specific lines do you see? Where do you see contour lines? Where do you see implied lines? Look in the Greenland area and look at the shape boundary, such as where the edge of the land meets the water or the sky. Take a look at the figure of the man and the horse. The figure of the man and horse actually use contour lines to define the volume. So do you see any outlines in this work? So we still can't eliminate either wham or hokusai quite yet. Let's look at depth, shape and depth. Shape has the wonderful quality of being able to create the illusion of spatial depth in a painting or a print or uh, any other medium. Which one do you think has the most depth? How is it created? Wham shows depth of space mainly due to the axis of the composition and the fact that shapes are overlapping shapes and that they are changing sizes. Uh, the use of smaller shapes for parts of the artwork that are intended to be to look further away is a very time-honored strategy to, to create a, a spatial depth in a work of art. Hokusai's work is also very shape-oriented and uh, they overlap uh, the, the, the shapes of the land, the shapes of the water, the shapes of the plant life. They overlap and produce a very shallow but receding space. So we can't really eliminate either one of these because both of these works 
uh, qualify in this instance. Luckily, the museum has released another few clues. First, the stolen work uses clear unmodulated color. Okay, so let's look at these. Unmodulated color means that the paint is smooth and evenly applied. Uh, there's not a lot of warm and cool variations within a particular color field. And so I think both of these paintings qualify. So we can't eliminate one or the other based on unmodulated color. How about value key? The museum says that the stolen work has a light value key. A value key is the overall lightness or darkness of a work of art and if you look at these two paintings you'll see that you have very dark colors, very light colors, and you have medium colors, medium value colors. A value key is created by all of these qualities but to, to, be, to be called light it has a predominant weight of light colors. To be called a dark value key, it would have mostly darks with some smaller proportions of light, light colors. So when we look at these two pieces, do they read as light to you? Uh, there really is not a whole lot of super dark colors in, in terms of the proportion of these works. So I would say yes. I think these are both light value keys. So we still can't eliminate one of the other of these pieces. So our next clue is that the artwork has more than one focal point. What is a focal point? A focal point is where your eyes settle and it's created in many different ways by many different artists. But uh, let's look at the Liechtenstein piece. Uh, the gray shape of the shadow half of the plane creates an implied line that parallels the axis of the plane and there is an additional implied line along the bottom edge of the plane created by the path of the missile and the clouds or, or the smoke created by the missile. These are uh, implied lines that direct our eye over to the right half of the painting where we see an additional focal point of uh, and you can say that that particular focal point center is the little black shape that indicates the nose of the plane. And uh, from that point, our eye moves outwards, following the nested and radiating shapes and the implied lines in the area of the explosion. So perhaps this is the secondary point of focus. So let's look at Hokusai. What do you see first? And why do you see it? Do you see the horse first? Do you see the uh, river first? Do you see the, uh, what, what is it that you see first? Is it the little man uh, that you see first? And why do you think you see these in any particular order? Uh, Hokusai focus our attention by using dark and light colors contrasting against each other. Uh, he uses uh, warm browns against cools and greens. All of these impact the way we see the work and allow us to our eye to travel through the work and find you know, primary and secondary focal points. So I'm not sure that we can really say that we can distinguish which work has been stolen based on the use of focal point. So one of the final clues is that the stolen work uses written type. And here again, I don't think that we can eliminate one piece or the other because if you look really carefully, you can see that Hokusai uses type and so does Liechtenstein. The context of the, the narrative conveyed by the type is very different. You can read Liechtenstein's uh, narrative type in the context of the Vietnam War. Uh, Hokusai's uh, calligraphy may have a uh, reference to uh, literature or poem. So let's look at one more deciding factor. So our final clue from the museum is that the work that is missing is a diptych. 
and I bet you guys have been wondering, what is that line down the middle of the painting in Roy Lichtenstein's work? What is that? Did he paint that? Did he draw it? If you were actually in the museum looking at this in person, you would be able to tell that this is created out of two separate canvases and they're mounted together. And so that is a diptych. If you look closely at Hokusai's work, you'll see that his print is a single piece. Uh, there's no dividing marks anywhere. It's just one single piece. So I think this is the clue that we've been looking for, and I think we can make our decision that the missing piece is Roy Lee. So how is it that these stolen paintings are actually found? They're usually reported by someone who sees the work and alerts the authorities or, or alerts the museum. And so in this case, uh, we get to be the uh, police. And uh, one of the reasons that, uh, that we might be able to find this work is that we work as art consultants. And art consultants go to collectors' homes and they look at the artwork that has been amassed by any individual person. They study the collector's likes and dislikes, and they make suggestions about what they might enjoy adding to their collection. So here you see the photo of this collector's beautiful home, and imagine that you are the art consultant, that the collector is showing you around his house, and he takes you down to the basement garage and he shows you the 10 car garage filled with beautiful collectible cars from the 20th century. But over to your right you notice a small room that's beautifully lit and it's filled with artwork and you see a painting on the wall that has a cloth over it or a big drape over it. And being a curious artistic person, you go and take a look. And lo and behold, you say, oh my goodness, this looks like an original painting that I just saw in the Tate Museum a month ago. So, that is the um, how these types of paintings are found. So, if you were going to be honest and report this work, uh, the, where the location of the work is, what might you do? We could certainly write to the museum or write to the authorities. And if you wanted to verify that you have the right piece, you might write to the museum curator first. So we might say, Dear Museum Curator, I am very familiar with a painting I saw in your collection recently by Roy Lichtenstein, uh, Wham! And I know that it's a painting created on two panels. And the subject matter is a fighter jet and a pilot shooting down another airplane. I think I saw this at a collector's home and was wondering if you would be interested in knowing where the painting might be. I, I'm very sure that it's an original piece, and I really think that it's the work created by Lichtenstein. There are a lot of reasons, but let me describe it. Uh, the painting focuses our attention first to the plane on the left by deploying a very dynamic axial composition. The jet plane is painted using clear, hard outline and contour lines that swell and thin as they move out across the volume of the plane's nose surface, and this creates the illusion of volume and space. The outline shape of the plane itself is broken into smaller shapes in gray, black, and white that interlock in rhythmic alternating patterns. The gray shape of the shadowed half of the plane creates an implied line that parallels the axis of the plane and the additional implied lines along the bottom edge of the plane that direct our eye to the second point of emphasis um, lead us to the uh, nose of the smaller plane surrounded by flame. From that point, the painter moves our eye outwards, following the radiating shapes and lines of the exploding plane. The secondary focal point is the nose of the plane, surrounded by red, white, and yellow fire. This area has hard edge shapes, but they are also some squiggly organic shapes. 
There are lots of implied lines in this half of the painting. The angular red flames are aligned on the same axis as the black lines set against the blue sky. My eye moves along the path of the implied lines and recognizes the unity that the artist has created. The background is filled with blue space, blue color, and the sky reads as fairly flat. However, the painting shows depth of space due to the axial composition, the overlap of shape over shape, and the use of smaller shapes for parts of the painting that are intended to look further away. Overall, the implied lines, the use of axial composition with radiating lines and shapes, plus the use of a limited red, yellow, and blue color palette of unmodulated colors, creates a very dynamic and uh, strong impact. The light value key and the primary red, yellow, and blue color palette allow the painting to have a light-hearted and distanced mood from the action depicted. Because the subject matter could be read in a more serious context in the hands of a different artist, this leads me to believe that the painting that I saw in the home of my collector really might be the stolen painting that you're looking for. If I can be of any further assistance, Mr. Curator, please let me know. So this is the final closing of our little video here, and I hope that the tutorial was helpful to help you learn how to look through a piece of artwork and uh, help you to put some ideas together in terms of how an analysis is written once you identify the qualities of the work. Uh, notice here that you have the credits for all of the artworks and where they're located. And so perhaps if you're in Cleveland or New York or um, Amsterdam or London, you might be able to go and see some of these original pieces. Notice the photographs for the the photograph of the mansion is credited and also the music at the beginning is also credited. Have a wonderful uh, time with this project and if you have any questions please give me your instructor an email or a call and I'd be happy to help.